And I realized that success at that point was if you tune into the directive of your high self, your your intuition, what you're being guided to do, and then you use all these functions of mind and and um, emotion and your body and imagination to bring forward and manifest that which you've been guided to do through listening internally through meditation and so forth, then you'll be a success because you'll be you'll be manifesting your purpose. Peace and riches, blessings. I am Michael B. Beck with the host of Take Back Your Mind. Peace and blessings, everyone. I am Michael B. Beckwith, founder of the Agape International Spiritual Center and the host of Take Back Your Mind. And as I like to say, take back your mind and open your heart. The mind oftentimes is hijacked by worry and doubt and fear and a deep sense of separation. We want to take it back. We don't want it to be programmed by the world of appearances. We want it to be flooded with love so that your mind becomes an avenue of awareness of that which is true and real such that your heart is open and full of divine love, success, and wellness, and well-being. I have with me today Jack Canfield. And uh, many of you probably already know who Jack Canfield is, but in case you don't, let me tell you. He's known as America's number one success coach, best-selling author, professional speaker, trainer, entrepreneur, and more. He's the founder and CEO of the Canfield Training Group, which trains entrepreneurs, educators, corporate leaders. He motivates individuals how to accelerate the achievement of their personal and professional goals. He's the co-author of more than 200 books, 200, including the Success Principles, Chicken Soup of the Soul series, and includes 40 New York Times bestsellers, and has sold more than 500 million, I did not stutter, 500 million copies in 47 languages around the world. He's a featured teacher in the movie The Secret and has appeared on more than 1,000 radio and television shows, including The Oprah Winfrey Show, The Oprah Super Soul Sunday, Today's Show, Fox and Friends, Larry King Live, and many, many more. This is Brother Jack. We've known each other for years. How you doing, Jack? Oh, we have. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. <laughs> hey, Jack, I, you, you have a storied history. Tell us a little bit about your beginnings. I know you, you were an educator, a teacher. You, you, you were involved in, in so much before you even got into the mindset of success. Just give people a little bit about your history. Well, I grew up in mostly Wheeling, West Virginia. My dad was an alcoholic. My mom was a workaholic. My mom and dad got divorced when I was six. And my stepfather, um, and I was a normal kid until the fifth grade when my rich aunt died, and then she sent me to military school because her son named Jack was killed, and she yeah. kind of adopted me. And so for eight years, I wore a uniform to school every day, and played football and basketball and track and all that stuff. Got a scholarship to Harvard to study Chinese history of all things, which uh, I always say. Is a prepared me to do the work I do, which is tongue in cheek. But uh, my senior year, I took an elective class. I said to one of my classmates, I need an easy A, something I don't have to study too hard for. They said there's a course called Social Relations 10. And it was an encounter group. We just sat around and talked about our feelings, our goals, our visions. And it was my introduction to personal development. And I said to the instructor, I want to grow up and do this. And they said, well, you have no undergraduate work in, in the psychology but I was a history major, so I said, I'll go to graduate school and study how to teach history. So I ended up in Chicago. My second year of the graduate school was a full year of student teaching. It was an all-black inner city high school. And about three weeks into it, I went, my kids don't believe in themselves. They have low self-esteem. And I need to learn how to teach that as well as history. So I met a guy named W. Clement Stone, who had a foundation, who was teaching people what he called achievement motivation. How do you motivate people to achieve more? So I ended up taking his classes, and uh, he was a contemporary of 
Napoleon Hill, who wrote Pick and Grow Rich. We actually wrote a book together. And um, I started running around all of the Midwest teaching this stuff to, to teachers. So my real work began by educating educators on how to teach self-esteem in their classrooms. And then I went to graduate school at UMass, studied psychological education. How do you educate people about psychological issues? You say if it's done on time, it's education. If it's done late, it's called therapy. But the basic... <laughs> I like that. <laughs> the basic issues are the same. And uh, one of the things that we always used to say in graduate school is if you have a problem, create a curriculum about it, you know? So basically, we're all teaching what we needed to learn. And I really needed to learn self-esteem as well. I didn't realize it, but I didn't love myself very much. And uh, over time, I obviously learned to do that. And then I started the growth center, a retreat center, like Esalen Institute up in uh, Big Sur, where we had people coming in every weekend. I wanted to take all these seminars because I wanted to learn all this stuff, but I ran out of money. So I started the center. We ran these workshops at the Howard Johnson's at a Holiday Inn, and I invited all these people to come in and teach. I got to be there free because I was putting it together. And then eventually, I wrote a book called 100 Ways to Enhance Self-Concept in the Classroom, sold 400,000 copies, started to be somebody that spoke at conferences all over the world. And then what happened was the recession hit in 1993, you probably remember, and all the school money dried up. There was no money for in-service training. No money was Nobody was sending people to workshops. So I had to ve re-vector everything to public seminars and um, started doing self-esteem workshops and then um, uh, breakthrough to success and things like that. And that's when I wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul, right about them. And um, then th that changed everything. It took off and then I got in the secret with you and some other people and that changed everything as well. And so here we are today. <laughs> right. So you started off with the whole self-esteem vibration. Yeah, exactly. And then you love yourself. Yeah, because that's what you need to learn, you're saying. <laughs> exactly. No, I grew up with a father who was uh, hostile to be, you know, he was a drunk, he, he would get drunk and he was angry. And so I literally, I don't know if you remember radios used to be these big tall things about three and a half feet, four feet off the floor. And yeah. there'd be a little dial up here and the rest of it was hollow down below. And when my dad was drinking, I would go in there and pull it back against the wall and hide. So wow. I went to bed because when he was drinking, he would, you know, like when I hit somebody and sometimes I was just somebody he wanted to hit. Wow, that's interesting. So then you, you moved into success. You become a great success coach. Talk talk to us a little bit about your teaching around the mindset and the vibration of success. Yeah, I you know, somewhere in that story I told you just a minute ago, I learned to meditate and to, you know, there's a thing called psychosynthesis, which is a study of the human psyche along with the spiritual reality. There was this guy named uh, Roberto Asagioli. He was an Italian psychiatrist, contemporary of Carl Jung, and he used to channel this Tibetan monk who was like disincarnate, um, kind of the way we do Abraham today and things like that. And um, his, name, his name was Dwashkul DK. And so he developed this whole psychology that included the soul and the spirit and the high self and all that. So I, I studied that. And I realized that success at that point was if you tune into the directive of your high self, your your intuition, what you're being guided to do, and then you use all these functions of mind and and um, emotion and your body and imagination to bring forward and manifest that which you've been guided to do through listening internally through meditation and so forth, then you'll be a success because you'll be you'll be manifesting your purpose. And I've always defined my purpose as inspiring people to live their highest vision in the context of love and joy in harmony with the highest good of all concern. So that, to me, when people say, what is success? For me, it's living my purpose. If I fulfill my purpose, then that's success. And everybody's definition is different depending on what they're here to do. We're all unique beings with something to express into the world that's of service when we be that. Yeah, so you're, you're talking about tuning into a frequency, you're saying. Disincarnate being that you were channeling or somebody was channeling, it was right. actually frequency. Right. I believe that, you know, what do you call it? God, source, that G, right. intelligence, you know, whatever. There is something there that basically is guiding us that we chose to incarnate to express. And some people are here to be musicians. Some people are here to be authors, coaches, spiritual teachers like yourself, whatever. And when we do that, then we're happy and things are drawn to us. 
we don't have to work so hard. You know, I did a program once called Effortless Success. It was a series of, of audio tapes and so forth. Shows you how far back I go, audio tapes. <laughs> I remember those. <laughs> but the idea is that, that we're each here with the unique thing to express. And if we do that, then we're happy and it serves other people. So you're talking about developing a mindset, basically, of being able to stabilize a frequency that then loads in your purpose, which everyone has a distinct, everyone has a purpose, but everyone has a distinct, like I like to say mission, the reason why they've incarnated. Right, exactly. And, and you're seeking to be in alignment with that mission and it doesn't come from society, it doesn't come from the world, it actually comes from your soul. Yes. And so you assist people in discovering that. You've written over 200 books. So uh, if you could synthesize your main teaching in a, you know, what would you, what, how would you synthesize it? Because you've written a lot of books, man. You've taught a lot of workshops, seminars. You've spoken all around the world. You've touched right. millions of people. How would, how would you, you know, I may be asking a very big question, but how well, would you? I, I, I can do it. Um, yeah. So, so basically the model I teach when I'm doing that kind of instruction is that the first thing you have to do is tune into what is my purpose? You know, there are exercises you can do going, sometimes we'll take people up a mountain, they'll meet a guardian angel, the angel will give them a box, inside the box will be a gift, the gift will be something physical that they can then look at and talk to the angel about to uh, understand what this gift represents as their purpose. So I would, first time I did it, I got a golden heart. People mm -hmm. get a key, people get a pen because they're supposed to write, people will see, you know, a playground because they're supposed to work with children, whatever. Uh, there's another way to do it, which is to ask yourself, you know, what are my two, what are the two qualities that most define me? To me, it's love and joy. And mm -hmm. so what happens is then the, how do I most love to express those? And it's through teaching, inspiring and empowering people. So inspiring with chicken soup stories, empowering with tools. And then um, in, in the context of love and joy. So my two qualities, how do I like to express it? And then if I were describing the world working perfectly, According to me, what would be happening? Everyone would be living their 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 soul's purpose. So that's my. Someone else might say, you know, what I get is that the world's working perfectly, as everyone's living ecological, sustainable lifestyle styles. Everyone is um, living responsibly. Everyone's uh, being loving. You know, whatever. Once you have that sense of purpose, then as you use the word mission, what is a mission or vision that will allow me to express that purpose? So for me, having a training company writing books, training trainers. We've now certified over 4,500 people to teach this work in 117 countries around the world. So mm -hmm. the, this is a form that my purpose can express itself through. For someone else, it might be to have a band. For someone else, to start a company, start a school, um, you know, whatever. And then, so now I have this purpose. I have my vision of what my life would look like if I were living that fully. Then turn that into specific goals. How much by when, you know? Um, I will train 1,000 people to teach this work by X number of data. I'll write so many books or I'll have so many clients or I'll you know, raise the, the level of joy on a scale of one to 10. It's, it's totally subjective of 1,000 people that I'm teaching. So having goals with a deadline and then having affirmations and visualization and feeling, you know, basically we're using our mindset, as you said, to visualize that goal as a finished. And to use affirmations, I'm so happy and grateful that I'm now, you know, celebrating having trained 5,000 trainers uh, or, you know, whatever it might be, visualizing it. And then as we both teach, feeling the feelings you'd feel mm -hmm. if you were living in that right now. You know, you talk about this, uh, one of your talks about effluence and, and the idea that your, your resonance is coming off of you, you know, you're being that, you know. And so understanding those laws, if you will, um, uh, that you can do and uh, and manifest that uh, you call it, I think, you know, the second level of manipulation, you know, right. um, then I, 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 there are these rules. Then, then the next step is surrender. So you're surrendering to the daily guidance that you're getting of how you're supposed to take that forward. And sometimes it changes. Sometimes it's like, stop doing that, start doing this, you know, and we have to be willing to surrender to that because sometimes it makes no logical sense. Then we talk about action. I teach something called the rule of five. Do five things every day to fulfill what we call your breakthrough goal. So if your breakthrough goal this year was to 
start a church, train X number of people, have your own TV show. You know, what are five things you could do every single day? He's something called the hour of power. So you have like an hour in the morning of 20 minutes of meditation, gratitude, exercise, visualization, and an affirmation of 20 minutes of physical exercise and 20 minutes of reading something uplifting to raise your vibration. So always looking at how do we raise our vibration, having a list of 20 things I love to do so that if you're not feeling great, stop, look at your list, do something on that list. Listen to Bob Dylan, go pet your cat, you know, <laughs> go play pickleball, whatever it is, you know, this idea that you want to feel good. Um, and then perseverance is important. Um, many people give up too soon. Um, and also I love, I learned a couple of years ago, one of the nuances of the law of attraction was looking at impatience. When you're focusing on, I don't have it yet, because why don't I have it yet? I'm impatient. It's not manifested. You're focusing on not having it. So what do you get when you focus on not having it? You get more of not having it, you know? So right. that's a piece of it. Having mastermind groups and accountability partners, I think is really critical. Um, so you're you're in that community, whether it's a community like your church or a community of a small group, um, someone to hold you accountable, especially if you're a solo entrepreneur. Um, and then meditation, really important piece of all that. Those are probably the core things you know, forgive this. We could go into like some of the nuances, but that's kind of the general pattern, if you will. If you do all that, you're going to be successful. Right. You're changing your frequency. Now, you, I like what you said about um, feeling good because it's the feeling that provides the healing and the revealing of something. And right. so you're saying do something, whatever it is, that's going to bring you the feeling of feeling good. So now you're creating from connection. You're creating from abundance. You're creating from an overflow, as I like to call it, rather than trying to wait till you're feeling good until the manifestation. You're, right. you're teaching people to feel good now while you're while you're doing all of these things you're telling us to do. Yeah. Whatever it takes to feel good, you do that. So you 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 yeah. so that frequency of feeling good is helping to manifest. Yeah, it, it, it we call it where you it's your come from. You're coming from that place of already being that. You know, one of the things I teach is called act as if, mm -hmm. and it, like fake it till you make it. That's that there's that there is that, you know, dress well and all those kind of things. But literally, can you bring yourself into the vibration of abundance, of joy, of happiness, of gratitude right now? You know, and one of my favorite stories, you know who Joe Vitale is and yeah. Joe talks about being in his apartment in Texas and he was totally broke and he had no money and he's got this classical apartment with a light bulb hanging out of the ceiling, a plastic table, a plastic chair mattress on the floor with one sheet and he's sitting there going like, ah, this sucks. And he goes to the library to get a book on success and he brings it home and he starts to read it and he says, start with gratitude. And he's thinking, gratitude for what? <laughs> you got to be kidding me. And then he said, okay, I'm going to do this. And he said, I have a roof over my head. I have a mattress. I have some food in the refrigerator. I've got a table to sit at. I've got a tablet I can write on. I've got a pencil. I can write out goals with my pencil. I can erase my limiting beliefs with the eraser. And he started to write out his goals and what he was grateful for. He made a whole list of what he's grateful for. And, you know, within a year, he was a billionaire and he was the, the Joe Vitale we all know, the internet marketer. And, you know, I think he has like eight exotic cars in his garage. Right, he does. <laughs> <laughs> but but there's also a story you tell, I think. Was that you? You had like a picture of a amount of money you wanted to make or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so W. Clement Stone, my mentor, uh, told me, he said, I want you to set a goal, Jack, that's so big that when you achieve it, you'll know it's only because of what I taught you. And I said, okay. So at that time, I think I was making about $8,000 a year as a teacher. And I set a goal to make $100,000 in one year, which seemed really, really big. And I did everything he told me to. He said, Look, visualize it, feel the feelings, have an affirmation. At that time, my affirmation was, I'm so happy and grateful that I'm receiving $100,000 a year through the grace of God and, you know, that kind of thing. And then I, I made a $100,000 bill, big piece of green paper, and I took a $100 bill and I basically projected it with a, you remember overhead projectors? Yes, yes, yes. I projected that on and I had a bunch of zeros and then I put it on the ceiling of my bedroom, uh, which was actually a mattress on a floor. <laughs> So every morning I'd wake up, I'd see this $100,000 bill. I'd close my eyes. I'd say my affirmation. Uh, part of it was God is my infinite supply as, as $100,000 come to me using graceful and graceful. So anyway, what happened was 
I would then visualize my $100,000 a year lifestyle, the house I would live in, the Navajo rugs I would collect, and so on and so forth. And um, about 30 days into it, I was in the shower and I had my first $100,000 idea. Mm. And I have a book that's called 100 Ways to Enhance self in the Classroom. I used to get the 25 cents was my royalty on the book. I was splitting it with another author, co-author. And I thought, wow, if I could sell 400,000 copies of my book, I'd make $100,000. So now I've, I've got this this plan, this, this, this uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, strategy. And so I start visualizing $100,000, you know, 400,000 books sold. And then ideas started coming to me, you know, take out an ad in Reader's Digest, with 8 million readers, you know. So I call them, find out the ad costs more than I'd make if I paid $100,000. But I wrote an article for them. And I, I just kept doing all these things. Eventually, I'm down in New York, and this woman comes up to me, and she says, I'd like to interview you. I was teaching at the college uh, conference, and she said, I'd uh, like to interview you. I said, great, who do you write for? And she said, the National Enquirer. And I had been visualizing being in the National Enquirer because they had 12 million readers weekly. And it um, turns out she writes the article. We started to get all these orders. I started a mail-order book service, one book, my, my book. Mm. And so people are ordering my book. My wife then says, hey, they're they're ordering your book. Why don't we sell other self-esteem stuff? We can have, you know, parenting for self-esteem and all this. So basically I had like eight-page catalog, had high school kids coming in after school, filling orders in our basement. And uh, I talked to a friend of mine. I asked him what his fee was. I was charging 300 a day for teachers. He was getting 800. I said, how do you get $800 a day from a school? He says, I asked for it. I was like, well, that's radical. <laughs> So I'm practicing in the mirror because it was very uncomfortable. I was afraid everyone was going to see me as a capitalist pig who didn't care about kids. You know, it was back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So I said, what's your fee? $800. What's your fee? $800. What's your fee? $800. So I get a call from Davenport, Iowa. I'll never forget. No, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And the guy says, can you come out on a Saturday and do a workshop? I said, yeah. So what's your fee? I went, $600. And he said, no sweat. And I said, what would a sweat bin? He said, we had $1,200 in our, in our, in our, in our speaker seat. But you, you spoke too low. <laughs> I spoke too low. So the next guy that called me says, what's your fee? I said, $1,200. He said, we only have $900. I said, I'll take it. You know, <laughs> and so from then on, my fee was $900. Anyway, end of the year, I did not make $100,000. I made $92,328. And my wife said to me, wow, that, that really worked. Do you think it worked for a million? So we put a million-dollar bill on the ceiling. And uh, a few years later, I got my first check from Health Communications for the first Chicken Soup for the Soul book, and it was one million one hundred thirty-eight thousand dollars. So wow, wow! You added three things there. You, yeah. you, you talked about one visualization, yep. two the feeling, yep. and three inspired action. You actually put your vision and your feeling into some kind of action. In terms yeah. of, um, uh, you wrote an article for Reader's Digest. You talked to people. You you did some things based right. on your feeling and your visualization. You didn't just sit around and just wait for a hundred thousand dollars to show up. Right. It actually moved you into doing some activities. Yeah, you get inspirations. You have to act on them. I tell the story a lot about Bon Jovi, the singer. Yeah. Uh, he was a garage band guy in New Jersey, and he wanted to be a record. He wanted to have a record label, be able to take him on and and have records and really be somebody. And um, he realized he was playing other people's music covers. And he said, I got to write my own music. So he started writing his own music. And one night he's sitting there and this guy comes on, like, you know, we'll say KLHC. He says, ah, oh, it's KLHC, two in the morning. No one's probably listening. And he said, well, I'm listening. And he got this inspiration, which was to take him a pizza. And he went and got a pizza and a six pack of beer and a six pack of Coke in case the guy didn't drink alcohol. Goes over to the radio station. This was before 9-11 and you couldn't get into the Today it's all secure, and he holds the pizza up at the the, the glass. Be, the guy's behind there, and he says, "Come in." And they're eating the pizza, and the guy says, "So what do you do, kid?" He said, "I got a little band. Any good?" He says, "Yeah." He said, "You wouldn't have to have a demo tape with you, would you?" He said, "Yeah, I do." He said, uh, "Can I see it?" And he gave it to him, and he said, "Would you listen to it while you're playing another song?" He says, "Yeah." And he said, "Yeah, you guys are good." He said, "Would you mind playing my song?" He, you know, he said no. I was probably listening anyway. And so he said, "Hey," so he plays the song switchboard lights up who's this local kid and he starts doing that all over the new jersey new york area and that's what got him his first record thing because he acted on the inspiration 
So we always have these inspirational things, go to this Starbucks instead of that Starbucks. And then we do, and we find we're in line and we talk to the person next to us and they become a client or a colleague or we fall in love together. But you got to be willing to follow the inspiration and actually act on it. Yes. Right. So he he, he acted with some pizza and some and some beer. There we go. <laughs> and got in the door, and then now we know everybody knows who Bon Jovi is. And he's worth four hundred and thirty eight million dollars. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Counting. <laughs> Very powerful. Tell us a little bit about the, the emergence of the chicken soup of the soul phenomena. So I. I realized what I was teaching, when I was telling a story, my kids were like on the edge of their seats listening. When I was talking about historical facts and figures, they were like looking out the window, fidgeting. I realized story is powerful. So I started collecting stories from Ebony Magazine and Jet Magazine about African-Americans who'd been successful. And I would read them one every day or week and so forth. And I realized how powerful inspirational stories were of people making up and so when I was teaching teachers, I was doing the same thing, telling stories of the classroom successes that I and other people had had. And um, one day I was doing that in New York and this guy said, there's a story about the, you talk about this little girl who was a, a you know, Girl Scout who sold 3,000 boxes of Girl Scout cookies in one year. You, know, you talk to most Girl Scouts, if they sell 300 boxes in a year, that's a big deal. So this, well, anyway, and she, he said, Do you, is that in a book anywhere? My daughter needs to see that story. And I went, no. The next day, someone said, that story about the one-legged guy who climbed Mount Everest, not a book anywhere. My staff needs it. I went, no. This happened like day after day after day. And I went, God is trying to tell me something here. Let's put these stories in a book. So I'm flying back from New York to LA, where I was living at the time. And I made a list of all the stories I knew. There were 70 stories, the puppy story, the you know, Mount Everest story, whatever. I thought, well, if I write two stories a week, Monday through Wednesday, Thursday through Saturday, uh, by the end of the year, I'd have 100 stories. So that's what I did. And about 70 stories into it, I had the breakfast with Mark Victor Hansen, who you know. And um, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm writing this book. And he said, well, I, I should write it with you. And I said, Mark, that's like telling somebody, you know, they're two thirds of the way through their novel, you should be the co-author. Why would I do that? He said, well, number one, at least half the stories you tell you stole from me, which was not true. <laughs> Maybe five. And then he said, and I know a whole bunch of stories you don't know. And I said, Mark, if you can go find 30 stories, we'll have 100. That'd be fabulous. And he did. And so we came out with the book. And um, we were rejected by 144 publishers over the course of like about a year. Nobody wanted to publish the book. He said, stupid title. Nobody reads short stories, collections. And uh, eventually... You know, through meditation and all that. We actually went to New York, went to the St. Patrick's Cathedral. Mark and I lit two candles, prayed, asked for guidance mm -hmm. to get a publisher. We were turned down by 21 publishers over those next three days. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Vegzo, who was the publisher of Health Communications Inc., who eventually published the book, had been in New York, had gone to St. Patrick's, lit a candle. He was going bankrupt and said, please send me an author that will save my company. And so we, we didn't find that out until three, three years later. Anyway, we met at a conference, gave him our book, and he went home and he said, okay, we'll publish it. And um, said, we'll give you, uh, what was it, $1.20 for every book you sell. You can split it between the two of you. We did. And then it, from, it took a year and a half to make the bestseller list. Doing a rule of five every day, we did five things to do that. Like, you know, speak at churches like yours and sell a right. bookstore, right, whatever right. it was. And it, it took off. Wow, and now it's like it's like, how many books have you sold of that 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 particular that that uh, that particular series about six hundred million now uh, six hundred million in the uh, fifty one languages around the world. It's fantastic, and again, you know, you had the the, the visualization, you had the prayer, you had the feeling, and you had action, exactly. all all combined to to produce that. That's powerful, man. You know, you continue to grow and unfold, obviously. Right. And your practice, you know, you medita you're a meditator, et cetera. And, and recently, over the last couple of years, you have been, um, you went to Rhythmia Life Advancement Center, and you've, you've been working with the, the plant medicine, ayahuasca. Right. And um, tell us a little bit about that journey. Well, I first learned about ayahuasca in Ecuador through Lynn Twist, who you know, yeah. uh, the Pachamama Alliance. I went down there. I'd I'd seen an article by Sting where he talked about the rainforest and doing ayahuasca, and I said, I want to do that. 
And so eventually Lynn was doing a trip down there. So we did it and it was life changing. It was really amazing what happened. Um, and so then when I heard about Rhythmy, I said, okay, there's a place you can go and do four nights in a row. And I'd heard of people that had been there. I saw that you were one of the founders and so forth. And I thought, well, this sounds good. So Inga and I went down, Inga's my wife, so we went down and did it. And we've been down there now five times. So we've done, just completed our 22nd journey. Um, there's a couple of weeks ago, actually. And for me, I've had some of the most amazing experiences of my life. I, I, just, I can't even begin to tell you. I'll tell you a couple, actually. Uh, please, please. The last one, I was there. What, As you know, one of the rules that you have, you go to the Maloka, you know, everyone has a mattress, you have a, a bucket in case you want to purge, and a blanket, and then you have a pillow. And then you go and you drink this liquid. It's a combination of a vine and a leaf, and um tastes like mud. And you go back to your, your, your mattress, and you wait for the medicine to come on. And when it does, for me, I get a little bit, um, I'm, I'm a little more unstable physically. And, you know, I'm, I'll be 80 this summer. And so when I was, I'm crawling off my mattress to go to the restroom, and one of the rules they have is don't touch anyone else, don't talk to anybody, don't try to send positive energy. If they're crying, ignore it, you know, do your own journey. And so as I'm getting up, I slip and I fall on the head of the guy next to me on his mattress. <laughs> like, and I... And I feel so shame, guilty, you know, like, oh my God, I'm, he, he could be out there, you know, in the cosmos talking to God. And I just landed on his head, you know, all 220 pounds of me. <laughs> so anyway, I go to the restroom, I come back. And one of the instructions they have is don't think about the content. Notice how it made you feel. Ask yourself, do you feel that way a lot? And then go back to the least time you felt that way, which is the source of all this. So I was feeling this, I was feeling like incompetent. I was incompetent. I fell on this guy. And and then I realized I hate feeling incompetent. I don't like it. And so where did this come from? So I go back in time and I remember when I was five years old, my father asked me to do something. I didn't do it to his specifications and he really railed on me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is dangerous. You know, my dad who's supposed to love me and support me is really pissing me. And so uh, my survival is at stake here. I better do everything perfectly from now on. And so I became a perfectionist. I overprepared for everything. I was always in a state. I didn't realize that, that there was always a subterranean fear below the surface for everything I've ever done up into my life up until two weeks ago, where, you know, if my shoes aren't shot, if I drop that ball, if I miss that shot in basketball, if I say the wrong thing, if I misquote somebody, you know, whatever it was. And so it led to like, you know, over preparing everything. You know, my slides have to be the best when I do overheads, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And I was able to let that go. And I can't tell you the amount of freedom that I have. I came back, I have a body worker I work with. She said, wow, what happened to you? You're so, you know, all that tension that was in your body's gone. The other thing that happened that was really fascinating to me, and we had tension one night, which was to forgive the unforgivable. Mm. I'm on my mattress, I got to some tension. All of a sudden, up comes Vladimir Putin. Because I thought I'd forgiven everybody, my ex-wives, my their lawyers. You know, whatever people who've embezzled money from me, my parents, and so on. And all of a sudden, Vladimir Putin comes up. I think, oh my God, I got to forgive Vladimir Putin. And he's killing all these people, like Navalny last week, you know, whatever. And I'm just like, I'm just, oh my God. And so finally, I, I begin to get a feel for his whole life. And I saw what was motivating him this need to do something significant so that he'd be remembered in history. And like, you know, he'd put the Soviet Union back together again. And then, so I'm, I finally got it. And I saw the, the, his fears underneath that and his sense of unworthiness. And I, I forgave him. And it was a release. And then immediately I saw the office to my door. And if you were to walk into my office, the first three feet on either side is like a shrine to my significance. It's like <laughs> all PhD degrees and trophies and letters from the president and pictures with Obama. And, you know, they're all proving that I'm significant, right? And I went, oh my God, I'm a little Putin. You know, <laughs> I had to own that. You got an ego? <laughs> and I was like, really, you know. So, um, so the, the, one of the intentions, as you know, is to show me who I've become. And I, you know, many times I've been shown where I wasn't a good father, wasn't a good husband, not a good boss, not a good friend. And then I was able to see that, own it, release it, let it go. That was great. 
And then I had one experience, Michael, where, you know, they always say, if you want to come back for a second cup, do it, third cup, whatever. And here it was, it was all night, the fourth night, all night, or go to eight in the morning. And I just knew something else was supposed to happen. I didn't know what it was, but I knew something. So I literally, I walk up to the front of the room. I'm like, I call it the Thorazine shuffle. If you've ever been in a male institution, these guys are shuffling. They can't lift their feet. They're on Thorazine. And I get up to the front and I said to the shaman, I think I need another cup. And he's looking in my eyes like, like you see a psychiatrist going, do I dare give him another one? I could lose my license if I don't do this correctly. <laughs> and finally, finally, he says, okay, gives me another cup and I drink and I go back, I sit down. And all of a sudden, I see this cross coming toward me. Like if you were at the Vatican, have you been to the Vatican? They have a Vatican museum and they have these crosses in there that maybe some bishop had which says gold Jesus on it, you know, and it's like probably worth like half a million dollars in gold and silver. And so it's floating toward me. And all of a sudden, Christ gets off the cross and starts walking toward my head. And it's like there's these fans like you see in movies that make everything float back like the hair is floating back, white things are floating back. He walks right into my third eye. Um, and then I this experience of like Shakti pod and like explosive white, magenta, silver, gold light. And then I just, I, I just, I just went to this. And, um, I fell asleep then, and I woke up the next morning, you know, a couple hours later, I go outside, and everyone's going like, oh, my God, what happened to you? You look like Christ. <laughs> I said, well, I kind of feel like that. It's like I could hug a cactus plant, you know, with that level of, like, uh, just unconditional love that I experienced. So it's just, I've had, you know, so many great experiences like that. And it, last time I was there, there was a psychiatrist who was on a mattress next to me one night, and he said, you know, ayahuasca is like, five years of therapy in a week. Mm. And that's been my experience with it. So I keep going because I keep having breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. That was your bliss experience. And then yeah. you, had, you had some kind of COVID lung healing experience? Oh yeah, that was way cool. So they say four things can happen to you. Number one, you can have a, a download of information. Mother Ayahuasca talks to you. And um, I'll share a story about that as well. But then you could also have like what they call uh, pintas, which are pictures. It could be like psychedelics or it could be like a movie you see. You can have a consulta. You can have a nada, which is nothing. Uh, you just kind of fall asleep and you wake up. But something happened. They say it's because there was something that was like, too difficult for you to deal with. So they let you kind of sleep through it. And you can also have surgeries. And um, so the surgeries usually happen. This, is, see, this sounds totally weird if you're new to it is either a, a praying mantis comes or an alien or a these minions. You know, those little things that look like fire hydrants that, that are in those movies, the minions? Yeah, right, right. So I've had minions and I've had a praying mantis. So I'm there this last time, and this minion, this uh, praying mantis, about as big as me, lands on my chest. Mm. I was having post-COVID breathing challenges. Like, you know, I've walked fast for... A little bit and all of a sudden i'm like <gasps> it's hard to breathe so now this spring menace lands on my uh, on my chest it says open your mouth so i open my mouth i'm, I'm lying there like then it's just bigger so i'm like if you walk by you'd say what the hell's happened that guy and then he sticks his head down my throat into my left lung and he starts sucking all this white powder out comes out spits it out goes back in does that a few times does the same thing with my left lung, spits it out, then goes back into my right lung and sprays it with some kind of liquid, does it again on the right side. And next day, I'm walking very far. There's no breathing problems. It's like, this is a miracle. And then the second, that was the next to the last night. Then the last night, I'm there, and he comes back. And I, he says, open your mouth. And I said, I thought we were done. He just says, open your mouth. So I open my mouth. He goes in. He bites off a little, like, uh, little module or something, um, a little, little tumor in my lung it's about the size of a pea comes out spits it out says now we're done flies away and it was like oh my god and I've had no breathing problems ever since uh, my wife Inga as you know uh, has left her left ear is uh, uh, she's deaf in her left ear and one night this uh, praying mantis came down landed on her pinned her head down and just buzzed in her left ear for about 20 minutes nonstop. scared her because she felt she couldn't move and then the next day, she did not have hearing in her left ear, but the hearing in her right ear was three times better. Mm. And, you know, it was just story after story of that. I've had 
minions come down. You know, on D-Day, you see these movies of like 500 people jumping out of airplanes with the parachutes. Right, right, right. So all these minions are coming out of the sky and these little parachutes land on my back. And I had ruptured my L4, L5 uh, disc. And they repaired my disc in my back. Wow. They had no back pain. So it's bizarro, but it's uh, it's what happens for people. Wow. There was something about the three intentions that you established? Yeah, well, what happens at Rhythmia is, is there's three intentions. The first intention is show me who I've become. Right. Yeah. I've I mean, nicknamed that show me where I'm an asshole. Because, <laughs> because you get to see who you became when you split off from your soul and you develop these protective mechanisms, which we call our ego, to protect ourselves from whatever that causes us to split off. And so that's, I've seen a lot of that. And um, then the, the second night is reconnect me with my soul, no matter what. And that one, I remember when the first time I was there, it, it, I didn't feel like I was reconnected. And I, I'm talking to my soul. And it's weird, Michael. You know when you do text and over here is a bubble of your person talking to you, then here's your bubble of what you said that goes back and forth. So I'm talking to my soul, but it's showing up in my mind as a text bubbles. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like I've re-merged with you yet. What's going on? And it says, well, you're not ready yet. And I said, what do I need to do to be ready? And a little bubble comes back and says, you have to surrender. And I said, surrender what? It says, you're still attached. I go, attached to what? It says, your house. I said, I'm attached to my house, which is true. I really, I don't have a lot of attachments, but I love my house, my property. And um, so I've anyway, been there. I've, I've, I've slept over there. I've, I've hung out with you. It's a nice house. <laughs> it is, it is, it is, it is. And so what happens is, I find, so I, then I said to myself, I'm afraid you're going to ask me to do something I don't want to do, like go wear orange robes and uh, sing Hare Krishna, you know, in, in the middle of Westwood or something, you know, and, uh, and, and my soul sends back a bubble and says, I'm not going to ask you to do anything you don't want to do for at least a year. Trust me. So I said, okay, I surrender. And sure enough, I felt this energy just flow through me, just like it was relaxing spiritual energy. And then all of a sudden, the next bubble comes and says, sell your house. And I went, UMF, what the hell? I thought we had a deal. And then my soul comes back and says, just kidding. <laughs> so my soul has a sense of humor. You know, so that was cool. But I, I do feel like I'm connected to my soul. I listen to the downloads. I take action. And um, so that was pretty, pretty radical. I had one more bliss experience, too. I saw this with you. Yeah. Um. So the medicine comes on and, the, you know, you know how in, in the in the theater, let's go say they're going to interview someone like Robin Williams and everyone knows who Robin Williams is. No introduction needed. And so you hear on the microphone, you go, ladies and gentlemen, Robin Williams, you know, and then he comes out on stage. Well, it was that kind of voice. And we call that in our, our work, voice of God in, right. our, in entertainment. And all of a sudden I hear the voice of God that says, you are about to experience what very few people on earth will ever experience. And then there was this explosion of light. And then it was totally dark. And there was no me and no it. There was no, I have to, there had to be awareness because I'm, not, I'm here to tell you about it. But I didn't experience it as me being aware of anything or there was an it to be aware of. It was just pure bliss. It was just pure. And I thought I knew what bliss was before that, but no, I didn't. It was like, it was just, and it was funny because the shaman had said to me before, said, you have to promise me, because we're doing a special medicine tonight, that you'll come back. Mm. Said you're going to look at your wife and tell her, I will come back. And you're going to look at me and say, I will come back. I'm in there. And then as the medicine began to wear off a little bit, I, I'm thinking like, why the hell did I say I'm going to come back? This, this is it. This is this is, this is is what we're all wanting to experience, you know? Right, and right. I said, but I, I made a commitment, you know, so I, I came back. But anyway, that was like, I mean, just to know that that experience is available yeah. and touch into it through meditation, you know, what Ram Dass used to say, we have these top of the mountain experiences, so we know they're there. We still, when we come back, we still have to climb the mountain right, to do yes. the work practices, yes. you know? Yes. Clean it. Yeah. You know, you've been through a lot in your almost 80 years, everything that you've described to us today. So who are you today? I mean, how do you, what's your motivation? What's, what's trying to emerge from you now? What's, what's, what do, what do you, what, do you, what, do you, what is uh, inspiring you at this moment? Well, I, I did decide to write a book called uh, Ayahuasca for the Soul, Building on the Chicken Soup for the Soul. Really? Okay. Yeah. 
And I've already uh, collected about five stories from people that, like, the ones I just told you, they'll, they'll be in there. And mm -hmm. Kaminga, I'll get Jerry Powell, who's the head of RISME, has got a story, maybe mm -hmm. one, whatever. But uh, I want people to hear, hear, read these stories and go, oh my God, that's possible. I want that experience. And then have the courage, because a lot of people are afraid of ayahuasca because they hear about the purging and the difficulty of looking at parts of yourself and maybe you don't want to see. So I feel very drawn to do that. I'm writing a book um, uh, called Unstuck, which has to do with getting rid of limiting beliefs and replacing them with positive beliefs, a process that a woman and I have developed that works almost magically. Uh, I'm writing a book called Living the Success Principles, which is all stories of people who've taken my workshops or read the Success Principles book and then had these miracles happen so they'll be drawn to the work. And uh, uh, Raymond Aaron, do you know Raymond Aaron? I think you do. He's uh, oh, a- I don't know if I know him. Yeah, he was a member of TLC for a while. He lives up in okay. Canada. Anyway, he, he and I are writing a book called The Power of Wow. And mm -hmm. the idea being like, you know, how do you create wow experiences for your customers, clients, and people in your church or whatever? So they they'll go, wow, I want to come back and do that. And I tell people stories, examples. They go, wow. wow. And so that, that's that's that thing. I want to spend more time with my grandchildren. So that I'm I'm doing... This year, I'm taking Fridays and Mondays off and writing and being with my family and taking a, a, a week, a month off to be with family, mm -hmm. which I've never done before. I've been a workaholic up until now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's exciting for me. And then just continuing my own spiritual uh, journey, if you will, um, and having more fun. I think just having more fun, allowing myself to be in the present moment and just enjoy it, you know? Yeah, I think that's a theme. Is your spiritual practice changed in terms of your meditation or things of that particular nature with all of these experiences that you've shared? They're deeper. I go deeper faster, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I have four different meditations I do. One is a, a Kabbalistic thing where you bring the energy all down through your, your body. Another one is a Vipassana, which mm -hmm. is just following your breath. Another one is um, a, a mantra that I do that I learned from a this guy named Dawa, who is a Tibetan monk, um, you know, and um, and then I have another one I do that a, there's a woman up in San Francisco. One year, my ex-wife and I decided, we were weird, to, to, our vacation was, we read this book called The Twelve Psychic Healers of California. We were living in Massachusetts, so our vacation was two weeks in California visiting 10 of the 12 psychic healers. <laughs> and, and one of them was this woman up in San Francisco we went to see her at the Moscone Center, and we walk in, and she's doing. She's sitting at a card table in the lobby before she speaks to like a thousand people. And first of all, she's wearing a polyester pantsuit, smoking a cigarette, drinking a Coke. So all of my images of like you know would burst. And then and then she was doing like a thirty second consultation. So I get in line, like walk up, and she just looks at me. And says, "Although you teach self esteem, you haven't fully learned to love yourself. Work on that." Next. <laughs> That's, she just said that straight out. Straight out. I mean, it, it was that fast. And then when she got up on stage, she put up her hands like this. She said, everyone put up your hands. She went across the audience like this. And when she got to where you were sitting, your hands started to twing, tingle. And then she kept on going and they stopped tingling. I went, oh my God. So she taught this four-part meditation with mantra and then letting go of the mantra and then visualizing light and all that. So I do that sometimes. But literally within seconds, I am in the zone. And in often silence, sometimes I get downloads. Sometimes I'm just at peace. Sometimes I get inspirations to act. Sometimes I get, you need to go see a doctor about your kidney, you know, whatever. It's like, right. trust me, whatever comes through, it comes through. Um, and I, I do some, I call it poor man's Tai Chi. I study Tai Chi a little bit. Now I do these movements. I don't think they're right, but I move very slowly. But and you're moving. <laughs> and there's <nearly> like... <laughs> Yeah, that's powerful. You're, you're a great you're a great example of, you know, obviously you've achieved a lot. You have tremendous success in, in, in many areas of your life, but you're still on the edge of continued discovery. Right. And, and now you're you're involved in uh, the theme of joy and fun, which I love because that's I'm adding more of that to my life to play joy, fun, because I've been going, you know, for a long time. Right. And now, like yourself, I want to. I want to add more fun to my life. I, I mean, and not that I don't have fun. I, I'm happy. I'm enthusiastic. It, uh, I have all of that. But I want to just have fun, not attached to anything I'm doing. 
You know what I mean? Just right. just just have a lot of uh just take off. Have a good time, you know. God, that's dope. No, it it's true. Help having a ten year old grandson really helps. Yeah. Um, we play ping pong, we throw balls in the pool, we draw together, we dance together, we yeah. make up stories together. So and then again, I think it was someone once said when your vocation feels like a vacation, you've arrived. Yeah. It's also part of it. I love what I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can tell. I do I do it too. And uh we need to spend more time. I need to come out and stay with you more often. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're always welcome. You hang out. Yeah, I was so glad that when you went to Rhythmia, because I'd been trying to get you to go, and I told Jerry about you, and and uh, good. Yeah, I remember I remember working with Jerry before he started Rhythmia, and uh, how well, he told that story where he was at passages that he was going to come teach you that God wasn't a woman or something. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, he came <laughs> and he heard me say Mother, Father, God, and he turned to the person and said, "Did he just call God a woman? Oh, I know why I'm here. I got to get this guy straight." <laughs> <laughs> it boomeranged on him. He got straight. <laughs> that was that the presence was beyond gender. It was masculine and feminine. And uh, uh, and then he asked me at what some point, you know, would I help him start Rhythmia? And I said, sure. Let's 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 go for it, man. You know, uh, it's a good thing you all did. It's an uh, amazing, it's an amazing place helping a lot of people. Last time I was there, I was leaving uh, Frank Biden. Uh, Joe Biden's brother was checking in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jerry was telling me about that. The next week, I heard A-Rod, uh, Alex Rodriguez, the baseball player, is coming yeah. out. So it, yeah, it, a lot of people. Bobby Brown and his wife has gone down there, and Terrence Howard, and a number uh, of people. He, he was a good, you had no wrong way to comedian. He was one of the funniest guys I've ever heard, but he would go through an entire quart of alcohol during his set on stage, and he hasn't had a drink since. Since since Rhythmia, right? Yeah, since Rhythmia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think originally it was it was going to be established to break addiction, and yeah. then then it just was changed for people just to grow spiritually, right? And people do do break addictions, but it's just for anybody to come and to deepen their spiritual practice and merge with their real self, their soul, and to have a greater expression of ultimate reality. So I teach there twice a year and uh, hold the hold the fields for people to go through their particular journeys in a much more graceful and powerful way. Yeah. You know, your presence is very well felt there. It's yeah. get, uh, your classes are taught with video, your name's up on the, in the training room, you know. Yeah. I, the board of advisors. You well. too. You too. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, and you and I bought land down there where we're going to be. Yeah. We, we get, we're getting a home. Yeah. Getting a, getting a, a home there because Costa Rica is a nice place to live. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we have a good teacher there, Kim Terranova. She teaches my uh, You Are the Answer uh, class, and she's an exquisite teacher. Mm -hmm. And I'm very proud of her. And um, Well, even yeah, I think I'm good friends with J.J. Mubarak. Yeah, as well. yeah. Yeah, uh, J.J., when, you know, J.J., you know, uh, yeah, he went through all the training here at Agape, and right. it's been a pleasure watching him evolve to become a great teacher. Yeah. And well, uh, He does a prayer. I go, oh, that's Michael. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's, he's anyone he's, that could just do what you do and he does. It's like so cool. He's definitely imprinted. He's got the he's got the imprint. Him and Paula Castro and Reverend Kim Terranova and uh, very powerful beings in their own right, which is what we teach. We want people to become powerful in their own right. You know what I mean? To be able to stand on their own on their own and just let the let the energy flow and be, become uh, uh, radically successful in their own unique ways. So it's. It's uh, it's wonderful to watch all that happen. Yeah. So, uh, Jack, thank you, man, for being with me today. My pleasure. It's all it, fun. So, if I listen, anything um, you want to share with your people, how they can, with the, with the people here, take back your mind, um, how well, they can be in contact with you, your next things you're about to do. And sure. Yeah. We, we a couple times a year we do a breakthrough to success training. Uh, sometimes it's virtual. Sometimes it's live. Sometimes it's a combination. It's a three day training. That's uh, where I teach. That little model I told you in the beginning of uh, success would go deeply. It's all experiential, so it's very powerful. We do some retreats as well, and uh, we have coaching programs, ongoing programs like a uh, legacy club, uh, which you just did an expert call for. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have um, you know online programs you can sign up for, and we also train trainers to teach the work I do. So it's called Train and Trainer. We do it live and online, both. And uh, just go to Jack Canfield, C-A-N-F-I-E-L-D dot com. It's all there. 
And we'd love to have you join us and be part of it. Our courses are all very, uh, what's the word I want? Um, uh, financially accessible, let's put that way. They're not expensive. We really want to reach as many people as possible and change the world one person at a time. Absolutely. That's what we're about. You change one person, you change the world. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. So um, have you forgiven Putin, by the way? Oh, I did that night. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. I did. I, did. I, I remember Ram Das at one point, he had, um, back in those days, he had, I think he had uh, George, the first George Bush on his altar. He was trying to forgive George Bush for doing something he had done. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Ram Das talking about, you know, having to go in and go deep to forgive him and yeah, he opened up a, a portal for a lot of people to forgive whoever the big uh, boogeyman was at that time in human history. Yeah. Well, as was illustrated in my story, it was the part of me that was projected onto Putin. Yeah. That I had to also forgive. You know, that was the big issue, I think, is anytime we forgive somebody, we have to own the part of us that's like them. Absolutely. And that's not always easy. You know, Absolutely. So, uh, I remember one time I was in um, Joshua Tree. And a uh, number of years ago, and I was on a, on a journey with uh, this uh, shaman from uh, Peru. And I went in, and these beings told me, you have to be more compassionate. And I thought that was a bit odd, because I, I, I always feel that I have a lot of compassion. Mm -hmm. And so they put me through these eight different scenarios in my life. And they were like little boxes, and every box had a scenario. So I relived each scenario. When I got to the eight, I said, oh my God, I could see where I was extremely hard on myself, really hypercritical. And because I had lack of compassion for Michael, right. it was preventing me from having total compassion on other people because I was so hard on Michael. You know, and it, it just went, oh my God, like that. I just woke up. I said, oh my God, I'm so hard on Michael. You know, so just very, not, not perfectionism, but it was just, just hard, I mean, just hard on Michael, just always had to do things a certain way. And and when that shattered, then I had way more compassion on him, just had more compassion on Michael, which then bled through the other people, you know. Right. Yeah. Right. right. So yeah, we're all we're always on the growing edge of becoming more, never less than our true self. Yep. But Jack, thank you, man, for your time. I appreciate you. Give Inga my love. And uh we'll talk soon. Okay, my friend. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. Stay strong. Keep keep merging. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Never ends. <laughs> Bye. 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 Have a beautiful day, <laughs> everyone. That's Jack Canfield. He's a beautiful soul. Almost eighty, but a um, it's a childlike uh, nature, and he's authentic in his spiritual growth, development, and unfoldment. It was uh, my joy to um, have a beautiful conversation with him and um, didn't really know we were going to get in involved in his experiences at Rhythmia, but it was, it was, it was great. Rhythmia Life Advancement Center is in Costa Rica, founded by Jerry Powell. I helped him found that uh, many years ago. I wasn't uh, definitely an, an, an ayahuasca aficionado. I'm a, more of a meditator, but I saw the great uh, effects that it had on, on a lot of people. So I, I helped him uh, establish that, that powerful institute there in Costa Rica. So anyway, have a beautiful and bright day. Uh, meditate. Establish intention. Catch the feeling tone of feeling good about anything. And begin to manifest from the overflow of feeling connected with the spirit. That's why we have a spirit. Have a beautiful and bright day. Peace and blessings. This is our meditation section or segment for the Take Back Your Mind podcast. Meditation is extremely important. You've heard me have a conversation with Jack Canfield and you've heard that one of his practices is meditation. You've probably heard that most of my conversations with my guests and friends have a similar thing. They pretty much all meditate or some version of meditation. I hope you're hearing that and taking that cue to practice some, some level of mindfulness, introspection. When you move from extrospection, looking outward, and you go to introspection, looking inward, 
it leads to transpection. You go beyond extral and intro to seeing with consciousness. Today we're going to do a little bit of existential meditation, which means we're asking a question. Today we'll ask, who am I and what's trying to emerge? We'll just be with that for a couple of moments. Turn within for a moment. Let your breathing pattern be normal, slow, feet on the ground, hands facing upward on the lap, it's a sign of receptivity. And simply ask this question, who am I? Universal presence through universal law, answers every question that you ask. So we're just going to ask, who am I? And notice what pops up in the beginning. Temporary identities may pop up. You're a woman, you're a man. You live in a particular town, you went to a particular school, you have a particular job, but all of those are temporary. Eventually, you begin to get a feeling of who you really are beyond the temporary mask that we wear. Who am I? We're going to do this briefly, but you're setting something in motion. Add to this, this question, which is trying to emerge from me right now? What gift is trying to be shared? Who am I? And what's trying to emerge? What gift is trying to be shared through my life? No judgment, no censorship, just catching the feeling tone of who we really are gift is trying to come forward. Just live in the frequency of the question, who am I? 
which is trying to emerge with gift, wants to be shared through me. Feel into it, just feel the frequency of it, the vibration of it, and know that you've asked a question that will sometimes sneak in on you, the answer, when you're daydreaming, you're sleeping, sitting at a stoplight, or come in a moment when you think not. Slowly open your eyes, that you're feeling a little bit more about who you really are and what wants to occur through you. Have a beautiful and bright day. I appreciate your letters and emails that you've been sending in, but also the notes you're sending on the Instagram and on the website thanking me for Take Back Your Mind. And I thank you for your support. As I've said before, if you want to support Take Back Your Mind, Support the sponsors. The main sponsor is the Agape International Spiritual Center, agapelive.com. We have a Facebook presentation, an Instagram presentation, a YouTube presentation, and a website presentation. You can donate to the sponsor at agapelive.com. It's one way that you can donate. It supports the podcast. Second sponsor, is Nutrarise.com. You go to Nutrarise.com, those three lines up at the top, you touch that line, and you'll get Adapt-Zen. Adapt-Zen are my products. The Super Green, Superfood Greens, and the Vitamin D3, K2. Both extremely good for your health, your nutrition. You support the sponsors, you're supporting the podcast. Have a beautiful, and as I like to say, a bright day, luminous day, because you are a luminous being. Peace and blessings. Your time is very valuable, so I want to thank you for lending us your ear and participating in taking back your mind. If you want to submit a question for the question of the week, please submit it to podcast at michaelbeckwith.com If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, please submit a review and let us know your thoughts. Stay on top of current episodes by subscribing to the podcast so that you'll receive alerts and not miss one single episode. And feel free to share this podcast with all of your friends and family. And until we meet again, take back your mind and you will take back your life. Peace and blessings.